You were not meant to be a slave to the grind. You were not meant to trade your life force for money. You can escape gravity. You can unlock your life. You got this. Let's go. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Unlock Your Life. I am so glad you're here taking time. I know we're all busy, but you're investing in yourself. We're learning how to stop trading our time for money, how to stop trading our life force for ideas, businesses, corporations, and even coworkers and people that don't really care about us. We're here to dig in and dive into the things that really matter, focusing on them so that we can live life on our terms and unlock that life. Today, we're going to be talking about why your business sucks and why you should quit. And I mean it. I'm not saying that tongue in cheek because there's some of you out there that run a business or maybe work in a corporate job and it sucks and you don't like it and you should quit. You just need the courage to. You need to audit those thoughts, take the process through and uncover what you really should do about it because there's a lot of you that are in businesses that are great and you should continue on and soldier on, keep making them better. But there are a lot of you that are in dead end businesses and you need to audit. Can I make this into what I want it to be? Or am I trading my life force, my time, my energy and efforts towards something that is really just not going to get me where I want to go? So what am I working on in my business? What are you working on in your business? One of my businesses is multifamily real estate. And my role is capital raising, finding these deals, negotiating them, and getting them across the finish line. And I mean getting them across the finish line by getting them financed and closed. But we're far from being done because at that point, the real work begins, which is renovation, retenanting them, raising rents, property management, asset management, construction management, refinancing them, returning the investor's capital, and now we have a stabilized building or maybe selling that building off. So getting the money and the down payment and the loan and negotiating the deal is only one small part and piece of that. However, that's what I'm good at, and that's what I enjoy doing, and that's what I like to do. And all those other pieces can be pushed off my plate. And those pieces are not less important. They're probably even more important, but they don't necessarily have to be done by me. One, because they're redundant. They can be turned into a process or a system. I can hire a property management company. I can have a partner in the deal that is going to handle that part or that piece of the deal for me. My partner, Yaden, kind of takes a bigger lead on the long-term asset management of the stuff and is a little bit better at that. I'm a little bit better at the negotiation side. And so we work well together in that. But what I'm trying to make my point is, are you working on the right things or the easy things, the habit things? So for me, when I'm in that business, it might be the habit thing would be, you know, checking on the rent rolls and and sitting in on all these property management calls and and kind of going through the motions because that's what I've always done. And that's where I feel useful. Yet, is that really my highest and best use versus going out and building the network and the branding and the voice to raise more capital or to connect with our next broker or our next deal, which is a little bit more uncomfortable? So am I falling into those habits? In my construction company, for years, I struggled as the project manager. You know, I was the guy who would manage the projects versus going to close the next deal and get the next client. And even at that level, that is not necessarily my highest and best use. And I want to think about a company. I want you to think about a company. They're both construction companies. One is building high-end custom homes, doing renovations, and working with a couple clients at a time, maybe he has a project manager or a few project managers. He's not swinging the hammer. He's got sub trades, but he's still closing the sales and closing the deals. And I want you to think about, on the other hand, DR Horton or Lennar or Beezer. And if you're not familiar with those companies, they're national builders that take down hundreds of acres and build thousands and thousands of homes every year. 
And the guys that are running those corporations are dealing with a lot different problems than the guy who is just meeting with the client about their custom home or their kitchen remodel. They're focusing on what land do we want to buy next and, and forecasting lumber prices and a lot of more macroeconomic factors versus the other guy who's just trying to sell the product and sell his services. So that CEO of Beezer is not sitting down with people saying, oh, you should buy this home. It's beautiful. Here are all the features. They've trained that, right? They have a sales team. They have an in-house real estate agent who's sitting there in the model home and walking clients through that. So the job is still getting done. And it might even be getting done in a better uh, fashion than, than that CEO doing that because that isn't his or her talent. And that's where I'm talking about working on the right things. Because at some point, whoever started DR Horton, they figured out, I've got to stop selling homes. I've got to stop meeting with clients. I've got to stop building houses one at a time. I've got to even stop building custom homes. I don't know if D.R. Horton built custom homes at one point, but that's not a scalable model to the extent that D.R. Horton scaled. If you ever go into one of these track home neighborhoods, I mean, they got like four or five plans that you can pick and you can modify these 10 things and you can pick from one of these three countertops and these two paint colors and these four carpets and that's it, right? If you don't like it, then you can change it after we've sold you the house and you move in. You can remodel it but we're not doing it. And they've taken a hard line on what they'll do and what they won't because they know that's scalable. And they know that the custom route is not scalable. They will only be able to build 10 or max 20 custom homes a year, which I mean is killing it for a custom builder, but they're trying to build 2,000 homes a year or 20,000 homes a year. And like it or not, whether you want to live in a custom home or a DR Horton home, it doesn't matter. Which company would you rather own? The one that's publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange or the one that is publicly ran in the guy's kitchen, which is pretty much how most custom construction companies are. And so as you're looking at your business and the business that you're in, I want you to think about where do I want to go with this? And your business may be able to take you there, right? And you may not want to go there. You may want to say, I want to build 10 custom homes a year, and that's fine. I'm happy with that. And this show isn't for you. But if you're struggling and you're frustrated with your business, whatever that may be, I mean, electrical business, plumbing business, maybe your IT, maybe you own a car repair shop. I don't know what you do, but whatever it is, I'm sure that you probably want growth if you're listening to this podcast. And so what are those right things to do? that you can scale the company and can the company even get to that point. So first I wanna talk about what are the right things we should be doing. Every action that you're dedicating time to should have either exponential results, it's one to many where your efforts are going out to many people or you have the ability to have exponential results like you do this one thing and if it works, it could be a major game changer. You know, you're not gonna just increase your revenue by 20%, you're going to double or triple or 100x your revenue. That's what I mean by an exponential effort. If it works, it's going to be a huge game changer. Or it's something that you can do once, you can work with a team, you can figure out and do once, and then you can build processes and systems around that so that it can be scaled. Okay, so if you can work on those three things, then you can build a business that will run without you and that you eventually would be able to sell for a good price or a good multiple. That's kind of would be my goal for my business as I want it to be able to run on its own, be stable, have stable cash flow that it's spitting off, and I want to be able to, to sell it at some point. And so is your model, is your business ever going to be like that? Because you may have to do a major overhaul or you may have to quit. You may have to quit your job. You may have to quit your business. So what do I mean by that? Guys, let's say that we're going out into the woods and I have a Ferrari 458 and you have a Jeep Wrangler and we get to the base of the hill and we start going up this road and it starts to turn into a dirt road and then there's potholes and then there's hills and caverns and crevices and pretty soon it's really, really obvious that I am in 
the wrong vehicle, and the Jeep Wrangler is going to make it to the top of that mountain. However, you know, if we're on the racetrack or we're on the interstate and we're trying to get somewhere fast, I don't care how souped up that Jeep is. I don't care if you've got superchargers on it and it's just can go through any mud puddle and climb any mountain. That Ferrari is going to smoke the Jeep Wrangler. And I'm going to take it even a step further because the business that you're in, if you're trying to go fast, it may not be a Jeep Wrangler. Maybe it's a Ferrari, but it's not a jet. A jet has a completely different purpose. If I'm trying to get across the country in a fast manner, a Ferrari is not going to cut it either, right? A Ferrari can't go 600 miles an hour. Our country doesn't have the infrastructure for the Ferrari to run on. It just isn't the right vehicle for the job. I need to get on a plane. I need to get on a jet. If I want to go over bodies of water, I need a jet or I need a boat. You know, I need a different vehicle for what I'm trying to achieve. And that's why I think most people, myself included, we don't think through hard enough, where am I trying to get? If you're trying to build a $100 million company, is the business that you're in going to work? Is the business that you're in going to get you there? Is that the right vehicle to get you there? If you're trying to build a $10 million company, are you in the right vehicle? If you're trying to build a $10 million company and not have to work in it, are you in the right vehicle? If you ever wanted to sell your business, are you in the right vehicle? Look around. You know that there are businesses that are very, very easily sold, right? They have maybe a higher barrier to entry. They've got more reliable income. They're subscription-based or whatever it is, and they're easy to sell. Property management company. They're getting paid every month and it's pretty easy to measure it. Those properties trade or those businesses trade all the time because they're easy to value and they're easy to sell and they're easy to buy. If you have a landscaping company and you cut 20 people's yard, probably not a very valuable business, right? It's too centralized and a few clients. It's too dependent on one or two key employees. If you have a landscaping company that has the contracts for Boeing and the Charleston Air Force Base and uh, all the Walmarts in the next 100 mile radius. Well, that landscaping company is worth a lot more multiple wise and just in general than the little guy mowing 20 lawns. And so you've got to think about, is my business going to get me where I want to go? So the business I'm in now, uh, or one of the businesses I'm in right now is, is multifamily apartments. Super scalable business, right? You can go from 1 million to 10 million to 100 million to a billion dollars fairly easily, right? The model does not break with scale. Secondly, you can sell it, right? Everybody and their mother wants to buy apartment complexes. They're never not worth anything. People are always willing to pay for them, even if they're 100% vacant, even if they're not making any money at all, the, you can sell them. If they're half full, you can sell them for more. If they're if they're clicking along and they're doing well and they're well maintained, you can sell them for top dollar. And so that is a good business model in that regard. There's also some limitations to it. You know, there's a lot of debt there. There's a lot of risk there. You're paying high prices for these assets because everybody wants them and they're easy to bank on. That's another factor that you need to think about when you're considering building a business or buying a business or switching businesses is the financing. How easy is it to bank this thing? How easy is it to finance this thing? Do banks want to lend on it? Do they like it? Banks are a pretty good indicator of what businesses are valuable and what businesses are not. If you want to have an eye-opening discussion, talk to your banker. What businesses does he or she see trading? What multiples are they seeing them trade at? How easy are this business to finance versus that business to finance? Talking about like, e-commerce and all the different strains of e-commerce. I mean, there's drop shipping e-commerce stores built on Amazon's platform, and they're basically worthless because Amazon can shut them down at any time versus someone that has their own brand is on multiple e-commerce sites and they control the product and they have X amount of revenue per year. Very valuable, very easy to sell. So understanding Do I want to be in a Jeep? Do I want to be in a Ferrari? Do I want to be in a jet? What vehicle do I want to be in? Where am I trying to go? Am I in the right thing that's going to get me there? Because not all businesses are created equal. And some are just 
downright not the right vehicle. Let's talk about your identity. Okay, let's say you do want to change businesses. Let's say you do realize maybe I'm not in the right thing, or maybe you're in a job that you've been in for a long, long time, and it's just not what you want to do anymore. And yet, you identify with that job. You identify with that career. You identify with that industry. I'm a mechanic. I'm a builder. I'm a doctor. You know, I do this for a living. And you've told people this for so long that it's just kind of who you are. I believe that is dangerous. I mean, my identity was wrapped up in I'm a builder for 20 years. You know, ever since I was 16, I was starting to learn construction, study construction. 19, I got my builder's license and I got out of the industry at 36. So, you know, I was in that industry a very, very long time and it was definitely my identity. But who are you really? Who am I really? Because I'm so much more than a builder. You're so much more than a carpenter, an electrician, a doctor, a real estate guy, whatever you're identifying with, you're so much more than that. And I've started to see myself as I'm someone who creates opportunity. I'm someone that pursues my passions. I'm someone that builds relationships and builds networks and I can make deals happen. I can get others to buy into my good ideas and I can get support around that. Because money and businesses and everything is simply an idea, an idea that we act upon, that we get buy-in from other people, right? So what do I mean by this? Let's say you want to start a shop, right? And you want to sell uh, arts and crafts there. And you make all these little paintings. And if you don't have buy-in, from your customer base to say, I want that. I think that's going to make my life better. I think it's going to make my house more attractive. I like it. I'm willing to part with dollars to buy your product. You're going to fail, right? Because you don't have buy-in from other people. The same thing with building a house. If I don't get buy-in from the client, they're not going to choose me as their builder and I'm not going to get that house built. The same thing with money, right? Money is an idea. We all say that money is worth something, but it's only because we all agree that it's worth something. We all agree that the U.S. government or whatever government of the country you live in backs this paper and says it's worth something. And we all kind of agree on that. And so when people say, oh, I don't understand cryptocurrency, what is it? There's nothing there. It's just bits and bytes. It's an agreement. It's an agreement on an idea that this thing has worth, this is scarce, and so If enough people buy into that idea, then all of a sudden that cryptocurrency, Dogecoin or whatever, has worth, right? And there's no denying it. I mean, platforms are built and billions and billions of dollars of this digital bits and bytes are traded every day. It's incredible. It just drives that point home that money is an idea. And so I think that you, once you realize that your potential is getting people to buy into your ideas and pursuing the things that you're passionate about. Maybe you're passionate about real estate and you want to buy real estate or, you want, or you're passionate about flipping businesses and you want to raise capital to flip businesses and fund them or you want to value add apartments or value add businesses or maybe you want to start the next Amazon competitor or maybe you want to do something that no one's even thought of yet. I don't know, but that's where I'm saying Don't tie your identity to, I am a doctor, I am a builder, I am X. You are whatever you want to be, and that box can kind of hold you in. So in considering where you're going, have a few rules. When you're going to choose a different career path, have a few rules about what you want and, more importantly, what you don't want. I've talked about this in other episodes writing down what do I not want and then sticking to that because there's a lot of opportunity and we can only focus on so many things. So what do I mean by what do I not want and how do I pick where I want to go in the next trajectory? Well, I think you can easily make a list of the stuff you don't like right now. Think about where you're at. Maybe you don't like your boss. So that'd be something you could write down. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I want to be my own boss. Okay. Take that a step further, too, because there's a lot of businesses that you have many bosses. Maybe you don't have a physical boss right there, but you have 
clients who have a whole lot of power over you. This could be in custom work, contracts, uh, consulting. You know, the client is very, very closely working with you versus like generating a product and you're selling a product. So in my line of work, my product is apartments. And so I have renters. And do I have to keep the tenants happy? Yes, sort of, but it's not a big deal, right? I don't really even communicate with the tenants. If they pay, they stay. If they don't, they get evicted. If there's something that's broken, we fix it. And and that's pretty much it. I'm not like beholden to the whims of my tenant. Now, I, I do report to the investors, right? The people that invest in my deals. And I do report to the banks that give me these loans to buy these things. And so I am kind of have a boss in that regard. But I found that if I just make the payments to the banks and make the payments to the investors, they pretty much leave me alone. And I can handle that, right? I I don't feel beholden to them. As long as I'm meeting my obligations that I laid out, then they're going to leave me alone versus certain businesses where you're doing your best and the expectations are kind of ambiguous. So that was something that was really important to me was like, I wanted the expectations to be very, very clear. And I see that in manufacturing where you're producing a product. I mean, D.R. Horton, going back to that example, if you walk in their house and you don't like the color of the countertops and you don't like the color of the floor, you don't like the quality of the construction or the houses are so close together, fine. You don't have to buy it. Go on your merry way and they'll sell it to the next person. There's plenty of people that are willing to buy that house. And that's the model that they've built versus if I go in and remodel your kitchen and you don't like it, we got a problem because that's your kitchen. I can't get you a new kitchen and you've already kind of bought it. And so I have to make you happy and therefore I am beholden to you. And so think that through of like the psychological relationship you want to have with the people that are giving you money and buying your product and have buy into your business. Something else I thought through was I want it to be scalable, right? I don't want myself to be the bottleneck. If you're in a business, like let's say you're a doctor, let's say you're an artist or an actor, you're the commodity, right? You need to be doing the surgery. If you're not doing the surgery, then you're not making money. If you're not painting the painting, you're not making money. If you're not acting in the next movie, you're not making money. Now, actors and actresses eventually, they can monetize their brand. They can do merchandising. They can do licensing and royalties. And I like that. That's a great avenue for them. But for the most part, when you're having to trade your time for money and you're the commodity, right, you're the hot asset. And for me in my business, it was I had to be the one that was selling the product to the client. I was instilling that trust and they wanted to see my face. They wanted me around. They wanted to make sure that I was doing the job correctly. And I was just very integrally tied with that. So in apartments, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, I have to, once I close the deal, the tenants don't need to see me. I'm not an integral part of that. The investors don't need to see or talk to me. They don't really care as long as they get their check and they get their money back and they make a profit. And so I liked that. It was very scalable in that I'm not the bottleneck. And there were also ancillary supporting businesses like property management companies and asset management companies and accountants for the bookkeeping, tax advisors. They could do pretty much every facet of the business for me. And I could sub that out as part of the business model and not have to do that myself. So that was another huge reason why I walked into that, that one to many. That was a rule that I had. I just didn't want to be the face and the bottleneck of it. Another thing was, yeah, doing it once where if I raise capital one time, I close the deal one time, I'm going to get paid every month for years and years and years and years as long as I own that building and manage it correctly. And then when I sell it, I'm going to get a big payday. I'm going to get paid again. And that was another facet. Something I didn't want was a business that was worth nothing. I did not want a cash flow business that at the end of the day, I couldn't sell. And there's a lot of businesses out there that, yeah, they generate cash, but only if you work them and only if it's you working them. And then they're not worth anything when you go to sell them. And I didn't want a business like that. And so if you aim for anything, you're definitely going to miss. But if you know what you want and what you don't want, suddenly opportunities are going to come into focus as to what you should be 
shooting for, what you should be aiming for. Because when you develop that and you get down the road with that business, it's fun. And you have the ability to push things off your plate. You have the ability to grow it, to scale it. It's enjoyable. It's not sucking your life force and turning you into a workaholic and giving you all those things that you don't want. Because we all want to get wealthy, but we also don't want to trade our life for it. We don't want to trade our relationships for it, our family, with our wives, our husbands, our kids. You know, And that's what happens, I think, with some of these business models is, yes, you can make money with them, maybe even a lot of money, but they grind you up and they spit you out. So choose carefully what you want, the model that you want, what you don't want. And if your business sucks or your job sucks, you need to quit and you need to get on the right course. You need to get out of the Jeep and get in the Ferrari or get out of the Ferrari and get into the jet if you want to go cross country. So that's my word for today, guys. Appreciate you. And we'll see you next time. Peace. This is the podcastfactory.com.